Hello, and welcome to the Let's Talk Transformation Podcasts. Have you ever wondered what character has to do with leadership? Well, we have, and we will be exploring this question in today's episode, and I'm delighted to welcome Mary Crossan, Professor of Strategic Leadership and Character Research at the Ivy Business School. Mary, welcome to the show. Great to be here. Thanks, Susie. It's great to have you on the show. Um, Mary, I know that you spend your time and do a lot of research looking at this idea of leader character development and how that can be used not only in self-development, self-development, but also leadership excellence and creating cultures in organizations where people and leaders can thrive, um, a quest we share. Um, And I know you've even created an app called Virtuosity, which was designed based on your extensive research, but also to bring this to individuals, teams, organizations, and to start um, democratizing access to this understanding of the research you've done. Um, And we'll come to that later, but um, we all know that character development can yield a range of excellence if you unlock it. Um, And let's start there. The idea of leadership character. So as we know, the science of character isn't new, dates back to Aristotle, but linking it to leadership is relatively new. So can you tell us more about what sparked your interest in coupling leadership and character? Oh, well, thanks, uh, Susie, for that overview, because you're you're spot on with the importance of it and and where we are currently. Mm. But it it was this blind spot. I don't know exactly how or why we missed it, because it's got to be one of the most ancient areas of study. (laughs) And when you look at it, for us, we fell into it in 2008. Mm. Uh, with the economic crisis, we essentially put leadership on trial. And we said, you know, as a business school, what were the failures mm. of leadership that led to that global financial crisis? And what what had we missed? And when we talked with leaders around the world, North America, Europe, Asia, we got the same answer. It wasn't failures of competence, but it was really failures of character. And that really took us off guard because then people didn't know what it was. They debated, Mm. uh, is it all about ethics or integrity or is it grit? Is it this, is it that? (laughs) They also debated, could you develop it? And essentially they turned to us at that time to say, can you guys, you know, figure this out? And I think the key thing that we learned at that moment, which really helped us was the idea that we wanted to elevate character alongside Mm. competence in higher education and organization. So that's the start of the journey. Yeah. And that's, it's a paradigm shift, isn't it? It's, it's a more complex as opposed to a binary model of, of what we're dealing with, but it's interesting. Can we develop character? Because a lot of people think you're born with your character, which you are. Um, I'm really interested in your research on can we develop it? I was surprised, Susie, at the beginning of this, that so many people had this really mythical view that your character is formed by the time you're uh, you know, five and that it doesn't change. Mm. And there is absolutely no evidence, no evidence at all for that. So it's kind of interesting that that permeated, I think, because we confuse character and personality. Yeah. Oh, and personality is semi-stable, like the big mm. five personality mm. traits, extroversion and introversion. But character is a set of specific behaviors. They ha- they satisfy criteria as being virtuous in their orientation. And every one of them can be developed because character is essentially habit. Mm. So all of us certainly have a you know we can we can observe what our character is and we can understand what it is but most of us have really underdeveloped character because we haven't had this ability to really understand what it is and mm. understand exactly how to develop it. Mm. Or we're hiding behind the myth which is normalized that you can't change character and that sometimes suits us maybe to sit behind that and think oh so what else can I do without actually exploring because that's quite a hard question, isn't it, to actually go inside and think, what do I need to develop? How do you get leaders and people in general to actually come with you to that space so that you can have that discussion? I think they get pretty quickly, Susie, as we dive into the dimensions of character, the 11 dimensions, and there are 62 behaviors associated Mm. with it. 
and they look at the model, you know, with judgment in the middle or what Aristotle called practical wisdom. Mm. And they pick up that a key facet of this is that any virtue operates like a vice in excess or deficiency. Meaning, for example, if you have a lot of courage, hmm. you also need a lot of temperance to be able to support that courage. And I think that's the moment that people go, oh, all right. I never thought my strong integrity could operate like a vice, for example. Yeah. And then when they begin to see that, you can just see their eyes widening as to what they thought were strengths mm. are actually operating in a dysfunctional way. Which is what happens when you overuse your strengths, of course. But 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 I mean, I really like that idea of virtue and vice. And because I think today we're all managing polarities constantly, extremes, which is part of navigating uncertainty. But it's also for me quite reassuring to know that everybody's having to find their middle ground. You know, sometimes you look at, at leaders and you think, well, they're just like that. They just manage it. And behind the words manage it, I've got an assumption that they're e it's easy for them. They're like that all the time. And I think it's really interesting to look at, particularly on the subjects of accountability or collaboration or integrity, things that I think we struggle with as leaders a lot of the time as to where do I put the cursor and it's nice to have permission if you like Mary to have two extremes so one mm -hmm. isn't right or wrong they both exist so how do I navigate that is a very different question to I'm not allowed to have a vice it has to be a virtue mm -hmm. can you tell us what you're what you were seeing in your research of how people reacted to okay I've got I, I'm allowed to have both <laughs> Right. Well, I think they can say that they're on the one hand, you're allowed to have both, but it leads to negative consequences. Of course. So, so there is the choice. Do I want to live with the fact that I'm, you know, operating with a deficiency in, you know, something like temperance? Mm. And if you look at, at the, you know, behaviors associated with temperance, things like being patient and calm and being able to, you know, um, handle you know pressure in the, in difficult situations people go well i want i want to develop that most people find they're very deficient in something like temperance on the other hand the excess side that's the one that really has got people thinking what we want to make sure is that you know our you know listeners don't think they have to dial something down like to yes. get you don't want to get to an average level so it's a it's kind of an interesting concept. It means that if you have all that courage, like being determined and tenacious uh, and resilient about things, that all of those behaviors in their excess, meaning if they're not supported by something like humility, mm. means that you just become stubborn in mm. what it is you do. And then you lack the judgment to determine, you know, at what point maybe I need to stop. And of mm. course, we're finding in lots of research, like the grit research. So yeah. think about there's a lot of grit, which determination, being determined and tenacious, that's a lot of grit, is that, you know, the the findings about that is that it, do, it leads to negative outcomes at many times. But the, you can understand character helping us say, well, I want that tenaciousness. I want that determination, but I need these other dimensions of character to support that uh, that strength. Mm. So it's really about understanding where you put your cursor in terms of balancing not only um, your awareness, but also the impact of the way you show up as a leader. Because if I look at um, the sort of, well, my quest is to help organizations and leaders create more inclusive and collaborative environments so that people can thrive. And I think, you know, there's a big push on DE&I, um, particularly since the end of COVID. And I think that's right. And for me, it was a link. I connected it straight away, what you're doing with character and what we need to create an inclusive environment. You know, the awareness as an individual, but also how do I scale the fact that you can develop character, I can move my cursor and that 
we together can create through an understanding of character a more inclusive environment what are your thoughts around that mary how does it fit into creating an environment where creating the conditions for people to thrive essentially yeah huge connection yeah. I, in fact i don't even know how we do this without yeah. character as a basis so yeah. I, i've been about 40 years working in the space that i've been around culture and strategic mm. renewal and I, I do kick myself that I, we, didn't, we never saw this earlier because I think this is where all the vexing problems lie. Think about this. We judge ourselves on our intention, mm. others on their behavior. So most people are in the space of, well, I didn't intend to dot, 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 yep. you know, yep. create some dysfunction or be abrasive or discount your point of view or you name it, right? Yeah. I did not intend to do that. Character is about observable behavior. So we have to start to close the gap and understand how it is that our intentions, you know, really mask the idea that we don't understand how others have, have received the behavior. I use the example for me of, uh, you know, under judgment, there's a behavior decisive. Yes. And I, I am not going to be deficient on the decisive piece. Like on that scale, it is, if I'm going to err, I'm incredibly decisive. But I use the example that my decisiveness for me, I think about it as offering my perspective. Somebody asked me what I think. Right. And I think it's the beginning of the conversation. Yes. But my decisiveness for somebody else could feel like the end of the conversation. Hmm. And so sometimes I, we talk about it like walking on a balance beam. Mm. You have to know which, where is your lean? And in my yeah. case, on decisiveness, I don't lean to deficiency, but I lean to excess. And the question then is, I have to look to these other dimensions of character to ensure it doesn't operate in that, that way. So how do others see me under collaboration, for example, as being open-minded and flexible? How do they see me under humanity is having empathy and compassion and really understanding their point of view. If they're not seeing evidence of that, in all likelihood, they're seeing my decisive behavior as being, you know, maybe railroading others yeah. and, and making it difficult for others to contribute to the conversation. So if we use that just as an example. Mm. We scale it from the individual to the organization. Yeah. The very simple statement the culture of the organization will be a reflection of the character of the individuals in the organization. Yep. So if we have these imbalances, you know, and we're overweighting on some dimensions like drive and courage and accountability and integrity and underweighting on others like temperance, humanity and humility, we end up producing a culture that has a lot of dysfunctional and toxic behaviors associated with it. And we all of us look to one another and go like, who's doing that? We yeah. don't realize mm. it's us because we don't see ourselves in that toxic behavior, right? Our intention and behaviors don't match up. And the other compounding problem is research on self-awareness reveals that 85% of us believe we're self-aware and only 10% are. Yeah. So we've got, we've got these two moments where people are going, ah, oh, you know, that old uh, comic, you know, yeah. we've met the enemy and it is, it is us. Yes. Yeah. Is that we begin to look at ourselves. So that is the, first of all, the link to character and culture, yes. massively important mm -hmm. link. And then to D E and I, it is, I think character supercharges um, that agenda. It gets us beyond the categories, which are important to understand for all sorts of, you know, critical reasons mm. where systemic uh, discrimination perhaps uh, is uh, is at play. But it helps us go to the true individuality of a mm. person. Mm. Our humanity, right, is is really beginning to understand others. Our integrity, when you look at being authentic and transparent. I mean, so many people do not feel they can be yes. in organizations, yes. right? So part of character development is helping us understand how we can 
you know, bring our best selves to organizations and how can organizations foster that? Mm. I think it's the honest introspection piece, isn't it? I mean, I work a lot on D and I, as we discussed before the show, I always start with the idea of the brain and bias because I didn't have those statistics, but I'm not surprised by them. The 85% that think they are self-aware and the 10% that actually are, partly because it's come a bit of a buzzword, but partly because we can tell ourselves what we want, the internal narratives, and then you get the intention action gap. And my belief is that if you work on understanding your own mental models, only then can you step into understanding where somebody else is coming from. Um, and I think the character lays over that in terms of, okay, so if I understand who I am and what's triggering me and how I show up, what does that mean for my character? And as I, you know, as I was reading your work, I was like, yeah, this, this just sort of overlays on the top of if I don't have an understanding of who I am as a person, even before we talk about leadership, <laughs> Uh, and understand that my character, I have personal agency on my character. Yes. It was one of my biggest takeaways from, from reading your research is I have personal agency on my character, which is more um, developable than I first thought. Oh, and that you know, that's exactly right. Uh, I think that people begin, as we often talk about it, you know, we go to the character gym, is that it, it, yeah. it's, as, it's as straightforward mm. as saying, we know, you know, physical fitness and nutrition to be important. Yeah. Now you can't just knowing that it's important. You sit on the couch, you're not going to get, you know, you're not going to get fit. Same thing with character. We, we can know that it's important, but what are the exercises that we're doing every day mm. to be able to um, develop that particular character? And I think that people have, you know, through that journey, here's where I really like the connection you're making. We call it core beliefs, but it's yes. your mental model. Same thing mm. language that you're, you're using. Character, the development of character, it's almost like it brings a laser focus into those core beliefs that may be really troubling us. So we hear things like fixed and growth mindsets. Yes. So sometimes we, you know, the words core beliefs, mindsets, narratives, all of those kinds mm. of things, right? There's these scripts that we've got going on that we don't even know are going on. Of course, yeah. yeah. And when we're into the work around character, the development of character, it's like going to the gym and realizing, oh, you know, I'm in a exercising that muscle and it's difficult. So why is it difficult? Mm. So why is developing vulnerability, which is part of humility? Why is that difficult for me? Mm. You know, and what is it? What are what are my beliefs about how that is constructed? Maybe my past experiences have been that I was really penalized, right? At a time that it was really affected me in a particular way until I unpack what that is. And we, we start to get, then get those scripts. There's scripts around things like, trust can i trust people yep. scripts about whether i'll ever be good enough you know scripts about uh you know whether people love us or they don't love us mm -hmm. and, you know how do we validate ourselves like they're incredibly susie as you you pick up those scripts they're just literally uh as endless and mm -hmm. as individual as we are so the character work provides a space of very real clarity about working on the development of those particular behaviors. And it's like pulling on a ball of yarn. Yeah. 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 Get you back into the narratives that you go like, Oh man, do I mm. ever, mm. boy, that's not, that has not been serving me well. And mm. I understand where it came from. I've got some work to do on it. Mm. And I think that in itself is what I call a courageous conversation with yourself. So it's an authentic conversation with yourself, which one has to be equipped for, I think, or at least a space has to be held for you to be able to do that. But once you've done that, you go back into the culture of an organization which has systemic memory of internal narratives that are internal to the collective system. So myths, I call them, around leadership, like you know, showing vulnerability is weak. Um, strong leaders do it all by themselves and other such things that are implicit or explicit, mainly implicit. So what are you seeing in your research when 
I'm at a stage on my journey where I, in inverted commas, I get it. <laughs> so I've, I've had a look at myself. I'm quite excited now about what I can actually do um, to equip myself better. And then I step back into an organization with a culture where it's like, oh, mm -hmm. this isn't normalized. It isn't permitted. It isn't recognized. What do I do with that? Because that must be quite a common building block for leaders who have understood what they're about and how they want to show up. And then the environment doesn't match. Yes. So we, there are five areas that create an intention to develop a behavior, character okay. behavior. We can get into the exercises after that, you, can, you know, but mm. you need intention, right? It's like, yes, of course. you don't have strong intention. And if you think about these five areas, you could be minus five to plus five on each of them. Okay. So if I had an intention to eat worms, I wanted to do that. I'm going to be minus 25 on these five areas. One, the first one is what's your belief that is going to lead to positive versus negative outcomes? Well, I think it's probably not going to be really good for me, right? Mm. Is it a normative behavior in my organization? Well, no, nobody else, you know, eats mm. worms. <laughs> Looking. <laughs> here's, here's the people that I spend time with closely could be in my family. Do we? No, not mm. likely. Right. Mm. Do I have a lifestyle that supports that? Well, no, you know, I don't, they're not even available around me, et cetera, et cetera. And the other one, would I have the ability to do it? And I'm not even sure I could, yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So I'm like minus 25. Now, when we think about being patient, we're mm. calm. We would want people to be on the plus 20 to 25 range, you know, in, and we'd say they believe it to be important. It's actually a normative behavior in the organization. They see it, there's reward systems around it. Uh, peers, mm. you know, are also doing it. Their lifestyle, boy, on that one, people really pick up their lifestyle do not, does not permit them to be patient and calm. Like people have yeah. overloaded what they're doing and they realize they've crammed mm. their schedules, mm. right? But that's glorified though, isn't it, Mary? We glorify this hustle culture of if you're not doing, you're not being successful. Yeah, yes, we do. And even in the organization, the normative side of it is like what I call busy work. Yeah. You know, people are doing a lot of busy work because if they don't, uh, you know, aren't seen as that's what that they, people equate that to productivity, you know, a frantic pace. And I can't, I don't have yes. time for this and yes. I don't have time for that. Right. We create these narratives in the organization as you described. Mm. So those five levers become really important. And mm. you ask the specific question is if I'm somebody who's really working on the levers in my control, so I'm working on my own lifestyle. Like I really want to create the space in, in terms of my world. Yeah. Uh, I, I want, I, I, I do believe that I've got a strong understanding about how patients will lead to, you know, uh, positive outcomes for me. And I'm actually choosing to align myself with some people mm. that I can associate with and maybe a partner in my development on this. And then I look at, you know, some of the big ones, it's not the norm of behavior no. in my organization. We still have a choice. We still have yep. a choice about how Absolutely. we want to respond to that. Mm. But, hard, but part of the issue is recognizing the influence of that norm on you so that you're aware of the fact that, gosh, everybody's losing their head here. And they seem to think that the louder they, they uh, raise their voice, that, you know, the faster this is going to mm. operate. And, mm. but, but I choose not to engage in that. And maybe through your own behavior, you start to create a contagion effect positively mm. with others in the organization. Mm. Yeah. And then it's the sort of the community building momentum effect of viral change that brings, you know, because you will take people with you quite quickly. If, yes. if you're saying something that needs to be said that is never being said, let me put it that way. Exactly. And you, and again, back to choices is that there's lots of research that tell us reward system, incentive systems, they really lag. Yeah. Great judgment, right? Character is about in the middle of all the dimensions of character is judgment, which Aristotle called practical wisdom. Mm. And so it's about bringing incredible judgment every moment of every day, what you do, who you are, what you're about, what you pay attention to. 
And so maybe one of the things that you stop paying attention to is those reward and incentive systems, which actually compromise yes. your judgment and usually undermine your performance. Yes. So because you're sitting there playing some crazy game about thinking that if I do this, it's going to lead to that. And you get mm. really transactional about it. And you've lost mm. the big issues like your courage and your drive and your transcendence and your collaboration and your humility and humanity and all of those kinds of things that are going to enable you to actually mm. have a superior performance. And if I, if I sort of piggyback on the idea of humanity and the whole practical wisdom and going back to the system of fairness and equity, um, I found it really interesting the way you used your research on character in to counter systemic bias. And I'm particularly thinking of the recruitment process yes. and, and the interviewing based on character. Can you walk us through that a little bit? I think it really sparked thoughts for me of, because it's one of the questions I get the most frequently is, how can we take bias out of our systems? And of course, human if all humans have a brain and all brains have bias. So it's never going to be 100% bias free, but there are ways, and, and this is one of them for me, of creating a more equitable approach mm -hmm. uh, systemically for recruitment of talent. Yeah. So there are many types of biases, right? So we've got mm. We've got all these cognitive biases mm. like recency effect, halo effect, all those kinds of things. So we can become more aware of that. Our mm. judgment, if you think about the development of character, there are, are uh, facets of it like being analytical, cognitively complex, critical thinker. Mm. Those are places where you're actually going to be more aware of those cognitive biases. You're going to actually yes. work those muscles to become more aware of how they're affecting your decision making. Then we've got all those systemic biases mm. around you know, not maybe recognizing the systems that were put in place that were designed for some and not others. I really love the work um, that has been coming forth around, you know, helping people to to not think about imposter syndrome in the yes. same way, right? Yes. It's it's recognizing that while people think about it that way, that that put a lot of negativity on the individual as feeling like an imposter yeah but the but the, uh, but the real thing that's happening is they're in a system that wasn't designed for them yes absolutely and that becomes i love that the, you know the quote uh from the nice hbr article on it an inescapable part of being alive you know now yeah. i look at it and i say well okay i'm a, you know i maybe i'm a woman in a male dominated mm. area mm. an inescapable part of spanning that boundary is being in a system that may not have been designed for me that happens everywhere right yeah of course so the dimension of justice and accountability as you start to develop that i, I just did them the other day with a group of executives it's an exploration mm. of trying to understand right what it feels like to be in those systems uh what kind of responsibility that we could offer around those systems now, here you asked specifically about selection. Mm. The interesting thing, when we elevate character alongside competence and selection, we start to allow for a way of understanding a, a vital part of what brings great, we call it the disposition to lead. So you don't necessarily yes. have to have the position of leadership, but that great quality of judgment and decision making. Now think about this, the people who've been those boundary spanners, so a lot of people who've been at the margins mm. have had to actually cultivate quite a bit of character yes. to navigate the world that was not built for them. Mm. And when now we say, wow, by definition, many people have, you know, it's it's that whole idea, what, what hasn't killed you made you stronger, is that yeah. you've been navigating those systems You've been learning a lot about yourself along the way. Mm. But it's why they stay on the edges, isn't they, it, of the system? Yeah, they can yeah. stay on the edges. Now, think about this, is that prior times where we weren't looking at character and it was all simply about competence or results or your prior job, if you couldn't get the, if you yep. weren't allowed, you know, the keys to the Ferrari in the first mm. place, you know, you don't get to the next step. <laughs> Yeah, you weren't yeah. even allowed to know where it was parked. <laughs> you don't know where it was parked, right? I love yeah. that, Susie. So 
So you're sitting there, you just never get into it. So all of these barriers be, and like competence itself becomes the barrier. Yep. The interesting thing, as we know about the development of character, it really actually enables the development of competence. So somebody who may have been, you know, not given those opportunities on the development of competence, but brings incredible strength of character, we can take a chance on that individual mm. and we can say, hey, look at, you know, we'll send you on, a, on, you know, that three week exec program where you can develop, you know, financial competencies, strategic competencies and those kinds of things, because you've demonstrated, wow, you know, mm. that quality of character that you've developed over a course of a lifetime is unbelievable. And that's what we're missing in the organization. Mm. So I think, Susie, it's going to allow people who really didn't get an opportunity for mm -hmm. the interview mm. um, and now can be in the interview and, you know, talk about how they've become the person that they have and how they've cultivated this aspect of character. Of course, that's what a character based conversation is all about. Mm. But it's great because it levels a very unlevel playing field, not totally, but a little bit more. And it helps us to break narratives around imposter syndrome. And, you know, I think it's quite exciting sometimes to be in a space where you can pioneer new things because the system wasn't made for you. So, you know, that the character put next to the competence made me think of that. It's also opening opportunities for me to, for me to do different things with my personal agency in a system that I know wasn't built for me, but that's actually maybe my challenge is to find something that is more suitable for other people and for more diverse populations, which which brings me to the Virtuosity app, because the, the question is always, how do you scale this? And how do you sort of start really running it through how we do things around here, in inverted commas, if I look at the culture discussion? So can you tell me a little bit about the Virtuosity app, what it is and what it what access it gives people? Sure. You know, we talk about leadership development or mm. development of any kind. And we use the term development, but we're really all we're usually doing is even thinking about that three week training course where we call it the temporary bump. We're educating, mm. right? Mm. The development and particularly around character, it's habit development. Yes. And it's a lifelong journey. So while we can run these workshops that help people understand what character is, the two, two parts of the scaling are you go from awareness of what character is to be able to assess your mm. character, to be able to develop it. And then we also want to embed it and institutionalize it in organizations. So we, we start to change selection as an example. But we also want to scale it from the side of going from individuals Mm. to, you know, groups, teams, and to broader organizations. The app was designed to take everything we know about what it takes to develop character and embed it in the app, mm. including all of the daily exercises, allowing somebody to be able to assess where they're at in terms of the character, where they might want to develop certain behaviors, track that over time mm. allows a partner one of the things we do know about character development is that having a partner uh really helps so the, yeah. those conversations that you were talking yeah. about there sometimes they're really hard to have for yeah, yourself absolutely yeah yeah and then um you know having that partner helping you understand it i, I my my partner of course is my daughter uh corey who did her PhD in kinesiology, focusing on the development of character. And she mm. and I partnered on the app. And, you know, I see myself as being a pretty authentic and transparent person. And Corey, as she was, you know, evaluating me one week about giving me feedback on things, she says, you're as transparent as you can be, but you are not transparent enough with yourself. So wow. you have often these expectations that are lurking underneath, sometimes that you suppress because okay. you want to be open-minded and flexible about something. Mm. And then all of a sudden that expectation comes up and it comes up to kind of, you know, it, it then is no longer transparent. And I said, wow, mm -hmm. you are absolutely right. <laughs> like 
I have to, you know, really get to know mm. when I have an expectation about something, when mm. I might be suppressing that expectation because I want, you know, to collaborate and get along about something and what's going on about, about those kinds of things. So having a partner, yeah, like we're gold, just mm. gold in the app. Uh, the app includes all of the resources available, like our videos, how we, we talk about how do you observe and identify all those 62 mm. behaviors, exercises, daily exercises about what it is that you can do uh, to develop and cultivate a particular behavior. And it also, to the scaling to the organization side, has within it the possibility that you could even run workshops in a group of people and say, okay, how does this affect culture? Mm. Uh, how might we begin to think about our performance management and how will that change? Mm. So we have found that subject matter expertise on the development of character is a real scarce resource. And we really yes. wanted to make sure that it was in the app and that people would have access to that. So you're basically de democratizing access, not only to your research, but also to your solutions and your exercises. And if I look at the accountability buddy discussion, it's like the personal trainer. So, so it is this, this needs to become part of who you are and how you live, as opposed to just, I've been on a three week course, tick. Yes, that's right. Mm. And we find the, the best way that the app is working for organizations is, uh, you know, have like a monthly one or two hour session on a dimension of character like courage. Yeah. And then use that as your launch point and then have the following, you know, the month people working on the behaviors associated with courage, like going to the character gym, mm. meet the next month, do a quick reflection on what you learn about yourself, you know, mm. over those four weeks of going to the character gym. All right, let's pick up the next one. Let's understand mm. humility do a two hour kind of session on that, then launch into, uh, you know, four weeks of learning about mm -hmm. uh, behaviors associated with humility. And then in organizations, each time you do something, always asking the question, how are we going to embed that in the organization? Mm -hmm. Like, what mm -hmm. do we learn about what might need to change here mm -hmm. uh, in the organization to institutionalize that learning, change those norms, right, mm -hmm. of, of mm -hmm. behavior? I think it's a great example of how digital can be used to leverage the impact of behavioral science and understanding that what I call the human dimension of um, leadership and, and transformation and culture in organizations. I mean, what a great legacy Yeah. Um, from two people that you've been able to spread via digital to hundreds, thousands, maybe millions of people is that the most transformative thing, Mary, that you've ever done in this space? I would say so. You know, Susie, my, my you know, I'm in a stage of life where one, you, although we never know how much time we have anyways, uh, it, it, it became pretty clear. I, I don't want to leave the planet mm. without embedding everything I know about this because I know how important it is mm. and really feeling kind of an, an, an accountability to do that. Yeah. But, you know, it's not just the app. We really try to do things like the question of character podcast series where yeah. we tackle aspects of character or, you know, the book that we wrote, the character compass and the developing character book, like trying to get all those tools and resources out there. Things like we work with Sigma assessment systems mm -hmm. with the leader character insight self okay. and 360 assessment you know, the transformative part is really trying to pick up all the tools in the toolkit mm. to enable the paradigm shift that we know needs to happen. Mm. And have you, I, I, lo I love the quest and I, I love uh, not just the app, but everything you're doing to share your understanding, but also your insights and the experience of different people. But where does that take us in terms of um, helping people to step up? And have you seen any shifts in the trends of how people react to this in organizations, particularly since COVID? Because I think, you know, COVID shone the spotlight on humanity, didn't it? Uh, particularly in organizations. Yeah, it's a, I, it feels like an incredible privilege for me 
to watch the transformation in individuals. Mm. And what's really interesting, because we do a lot of train the trainer, is 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 the multiplier effect. Yes. And individuals take this forward in organizations. And there's some really big metrics. I mean, you look at differences between weak and strong character, things like an 18% increase in employee voice. Wow. Like that is That's huge. Stunning. And you begin to understand if you're why that occurs in organizations, right? It takes courage to mm. speak to power, but it also means that in our organizations, we have not been able to make it psychologically safe. So another piece is a 16% improvement in psychological safety, mm. meaning that you take that, you take me as an example. If you have a lot of, the, of that decisiveness and it tends to shut down conversation, it's not that, that I intended yes. for something not mm -hmm. to be safe, but did I really create an environment in which people felt they could have voice and they felt that it wasn't you know, the yeah. end of the decision? Those are those micro moments. That's the stuff, right? That we're, we're, mm -hmm. we're really trying to solve. And that we begin to see all of these, you know, changes in individuals and in organizations around these big metrics. That must be brilliant to see those changes and just think, mm -hmm. yeah, this, I mean, it is an important question for creating organizations where people can thrive. And I think, you know, we have to change the paradigm on how people live in organizations because there's a lot of suffering still, isn't there? And anything that can leverage that, particularly that also leverages an understanding of self, I think is great. And Susie, I want to, I want to add here that we never apologize about the fact that the development of character helps people personally and professionally. Mm. And that actually the work that people do and a lot of motivation is because they want it in their lives. They want yeah. to be a better parent, a better partner. Mm. They, they want to be that person that can navigate the, the stresses, like some of the biggest stresses we face in the world are on the personal side. Of course. And the organization ends up benefiting from it. Mm. So the, the beauty is this isn't one of those typical training programs that people are doing to say, all right, become a better you know, leader mm. in this organization. Mm. Mm. And we typically find people realizing that this is very holistic and the motivation for it is life. Mm. And that is also very inspiring. Yeah. Yeah. It's self-leadership, isn't it? It's, it's who you are in your life, full stop, which, which is a short sentence with big impacts. <laughs> but we could talk for hours about that. But as time is running, I do have one last question, Mary. We've covered lots and lots of different models and thoughts around, and experiences around character. What would be your your call to action or your recommendations for our listeners who are sitting there having a light bulb moment about, oh, okay, there's a lever I didn't know I had. And what should I do about, about what can I do about that? Right. I think, Susie, the first step is um, just uh, taking a look at some of the materials that are that are out there, right? You mm. you can start, you can just start to acquaint yourself. So there's an Instagram account, Virtuosity Character, has lots of uh, materials about it. The Question of Character podcast series, really great. The Ivy Business School, where I work, the Leadership Institute has a myriad of resources around what it is that people can do. I think if once people are, are beyond that, oh yeah, I've learned about, and I get lots and lots of requests, like what do I do now? I really want to uh, do something about it. One of the reasons uh, that Bill Furlong and I, who I've worked a lot with, started a consulting firm called Leader Character Associates is because we wanted to help organizations mm. uh, figure out how they would strategically embed character in organizations. So if you're somebody who's listening that goes, okay, I'm the head of HR yes. and I want to bring this into the, you know, you're going to need a lot more than just reading the character yes. company book and learning about it. You want to know like what, how do I actually, you know, I want to do this now and I want to move this forward. If you're an individual, um, I think the virtuosity app is a really good way to go. If you're just saying, mm. oh, okay, I now get it and I want to go to the character gym, that would be a really good uh, avenue as well. Okay, excellent. So I'm going to put all those links in the show notes so that people can get to them. 
Mary, thank you very much for coming and sharing your expertise, your experience, your insights. Where can people find out more about you, more particularly, and and what you do? Well, I'm yeah. I have. I just got my daughter put me on LinkedIn because okay. she <laughs> said, you know, she says I've avoided social media, and uh, she says, you know, people need to. You're, you're mm. always reading something. So literally, just about a month ago. So LinkedIn. Mary Cross and on LinkedIn would be a good way to find and be in touch with me. Uh, the other places, of course, are simply through virtuosity character because of the fact that I, I do do work there, leader character associates and at the Ivy Business School. So I have all of these, you know, pools of places mm. that, uh, that I, uh, uh, I operate in. Okay, excellent. I'll also put your LinkedIn uh, profile link in the show notes. Okay. Thank you. Mary, thank you for what you do for your work. And thank you for a great conversation. Thank you, Susie. It's been great to be on this uh, I, with you. Likewise, it's been a pleasure.